I'm going to talk broadly about the, the platform we're using for assessing adaptive and innate immune responses towards uh, novel therapeutic proteins we're developing and uh, using the, our AFBody FC Fusion uh, platform as an example. So AFBody technology is a uh, small and robust non-IG scaffold for protein targeting and uh, or originally it's um, derived from protein A, so it's staph aureus, it's staph aureus protein, but it's heavily modified. Still, it's not of human origin, so you can understand it's very important to assess the immunogenicity, potential immunogenicity of the candidates we have. Uh, it's three alpha helices, uh, two of which uh, have 13 variable amino acids that we vary, and using big libraries of these, we can select binders to, to basically any uh, protein. Um, and they are very efficiently produced in E. coli or by synthesis. They're very small, six kilodaltons, and uh, have a rapid folding. And they're used for uh, therapy, but also for biotech imaging and other applications. And you can uh, easily uh, make uh, bispecifics or fusion proteins or other modifications in this platform. So, Everybody, FC fusion proteins, there we basically fuse the FC domain of uh, human IgG1 to, to everybody's. So um, these are also produced in E. coli, which gives low COGS. And we have preserved uh, FC RN recycling functions, but no effector functions because the molecules are deglycosylated. And we have two arms, like an uh, antibody higher ability, and a potentially reduced risk for immune reactivity due to published T regitopes in the FC, again, FC uh, human IgG1 FC. Uh, yes, so the PK of these molecules is uh, very nice, similar to regular antibodies due to the FCRN uh, reshuffling. So this is just showing some PK data in macaques. So long terminal half-life and low clearance. So this is the screening funnel we use when selecting our candidates. So we have billions of molecules going in and then we use phage display screens in, and several affinity maturations to select our final uh, binders. Then these are characterized for stabilities and then target potency. And then further down here, we start looking at immunogenicity and then go into PKPD studies. And finally, we have a, a candidate. So I will focus around this part where we start looking at antigenicity and immunogenicity. <coughs> so characterization. So this is the, we have our protein and we have a process. And of course we have potential process specific contaminants, which we have to assess. And they could also contribute to immunogenicity. And we also have to assess the effector function since we have an FC. We look at immunogenicity of the uh, antibody parts here. And we look at off-target binding. So starting with the process-specific contaminants, we have potential contamination with host cell proteins, and these are produced in E. coli. And we look for using generic ELISAs for host cell proteins and then sometimes developing specific assays if we identify uh, a few very problematic uh, HCPs which are uh, co-purified with our proteins. Then we identify all the HCPs with uh, LCMSMS and we sometimes do in silico immunogenicity assessment to see if the HCPs are especially immunogenic. We also 
as part of the HCPs, we have dams and PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And we, for that, we do, uh, so this is more innate immunity, and we do the whole blood assay, as Jeremy introduced. We also do PBMC-based assays. And the readout is usually uh, MSD, electrochemiluminescent and Templex cytokine readout, or fluorospot or L-spot looking at PBMC assays. And we also use uh, toll-like specific assays using cell lines expressing different toll-like receptors and uh, looking at those uh, activated pathways. So effector functions and off-target binding. Uh, for effector functions, we have also we have to of course see that we still have FCRM uh, binding, which is uh, important for the plasma half-life and pharmacokinetics. And we also want to see that we don't have FC receptor binding, or FC gamma receptor. We don't want uh, ADCC and other effector functions. We also look for the C1Q binding for CDC effector functions, which we don't want to have. So these are usually assessed using octet, so bilayer interferometry or surface plasma resonance type of assays, protein kinetics, so measuring affinity to all these receptors. <coughs> we also look with cellular flow-based assays for ADCC and CDC. We also look at tissue cross-reactivity in, in macaques, so binding different organs and looking uh, immunohistochemistry analysis. So now just some examples of what we see. So this, are, this is a uh, bilayer interferometry analysis of a antibody FC molecule compared to a IgG, a full IgG. And they look very similar in the, in the association and dissociation rates to, to FCRM. And then we look at all the FC gamma receptors. 1A, 2A, 3A, 2B, 3B, and some variants of 3A, and also uh, complements of C1Q. And we see that if, the, if we express, express glycosylated variants of the molecules, they actually bind FC gamma receptors quite efficiently, but if they are deglycosylated, <coughs> they don't bind at all. So that's what we're looking for. So, Jeremy already uh, talked about the factors affecting immunogenicity, so just some repetition. So we can, of course, have immunogenic epitopes. Uh, we can create new antigens, protein mismatches. And also the impurities, the dams and PAMPs and HCPs can contribute to immunogenicity. We also can have chemical modifications, aggregates, and process-related uh, problems. And, and of course the route and the frequency of delivery and the dose is important. So there's a lot of factors, uh, not only of course the immunogenic epitopes, which I will talk about more. And also you can have pre-existing antibodies and genetic factors, different HLAs and so on. So how do we analyze the CD4 T cell epitopes? So we usually do in silico predictions first, because if we have a large set of candidates, it's uh, very expensive to do the more uh, cell-based assays. So we, we start with the in silico prediction, then we look at binding to recombinant HLAs, as Jeremy talked about. Uh, we do look at peptide presentation by dendritic cells using the ProPresent assay. We look at CD4 T cell proliferation, either using the DCT assay with full link protein, as Jeremy talked about, or uh, using synthesized peptides that we found in this part, or looking at PBMCs and L spots, or floral spots, if we want to look at several cytokines. All right, so this is the basically what we look at in the silico predictions. The in silico predictions are was based on the uh, DR1 binding pocket profiles which are published. 
and then basically in silico you chop up your protein in nightmares and look at affinities uh, usually using some common HLA class 2 alleles covering uh, basically the whole global population uh, but also we don't only look at the MHC phase we also look at the TCR phase because it, it could be that if you have high homology on the TCR phase to endogenous proteins it might be a Treg or a tolerogenic epitope so it could be good to look at that aspect as well yeah so this is just an example we work sometimes with a zero called Epivax and this is the kind of data they usually present so you have the different DR1s here and then uh, some peptides presenting clusters so they bind to a number of different HLAs they're more promiscuous and therefore may be more uh, problematic in vivo uh, and uh, some of them are predicted T regitopes and uh, Epimatrix gives a T regitope adjusted score using this Janus matrix uh, algorithm that they're uh, they're using so basically if you have a two epitope it could ameliorate the response to an effector epitope in the same protein so that's in silico then in vitro this is a more traditional uh, peptide competition assay looking at affinity so you test all your predicted peptides for binding to different HLAs and get affinity scores. And then we have the ProPresent assays, nicely introduced by Jeremy, so I won't dwell on them. So you have the ProPresent, looking at the peptides on the cell surface by LCMSMS, and BCT assays, looking at protein processing and T cell activation, CD4 T cell proliferation. And as also Jeremy talked about, the recent Novo Nordisk study shows that there actually is some connection between uh, predictions and what happens in the clinic. And also there's other publications showing that from other companies. All right, so now some uh, of our data. What, what do we actually see when we apply these methods? So now I'm going to talk about these methods applied to the Afrobody FC platform. So starting with in silico predictions, here we have an example of two leads. These were very late leads, uh, late down in the funnel, screening funnel. And these are actually directed to the same uh, target. And the only different four amino acids here in the first helix. So this is only the afibody part. We also have the FC part here. I, I won't show data on that part, but I can say that, of course, we have peptides presented from FC as well, looking at ProPresent. And those, of course, could be potential t regitopes. <clears throat> so we do usually in silico predictions using commercial and other platforms, and they usually correlate quite well. So in this case, what we saw was basically the silico predictions predicted that they were pretty identical. The same peptides were immunogenic, binding to approximately the same amount, amounts of different HLAs. So in silico, we couldn't really uh, differentiate between these two candidates. And also looking at all the other um, things in our funnel, the bind target binding, stability and so on, they were very similar. So there was nothing really uh, differentiating. So the next step was ProPresent. So now we see a difference. So for one candidate A, we have 25% of all the tested donors presenting a peptide in Helix 1. And then in Helix 2, we have something from, from B, and in Helix 3, both of them present. But this is interesting because the Helix A, uh, as you remember, was the one with four amino acid differences. 
So we tried to look in depth what this could mean and why this was. But looking at that peptide, we couldn't really see the amino acid differences were not really affecting the MHC phase and there was no big homology with endogenous human proteins in the TCR phase. So it's not the T regitope in one of the variants. So my only theory, it, it could be maybe have to do with peptide processing and presentation somehow that it's shown in one of the variants. So this was interesting. And the next step we wanted to know is this affecting <coughs> also binding to T cells and potential immunogenicity. So we did a DCT assay. And here we see that the A variant is actually quite antigenic. Uh, in, this is uh, percent antigenicity in 18 tested donors. While the B variant is very inert. And as a control, we also tested FC, the FC part alone, which was actually higher than expected. And this could maybe be because that was not as thoroughly uh, purified and uh, analyzed as the other proteins. That was more. So that, of course, can have an impact on presentation and, and so on. But these were purified in the same way, and they are very different in this assay. So that's interesting. So on the basis of that, we actually went with this candidate in the end. So these assays were very important in the like, final selection process, I would say. Uh, so another example. So these are um, comparing to other candidates. And these are directed to different targets. So you see they have, they have a lot of changes in helix 1 and, and helix 2. And we predict different epitopes, 1, 2, 3 here, and 4 and 5. In, this helix is conserved, so here we have the same epitopes predicted in silico. Also, the predicted epitopes from this uh, candidate uh, were also had high affinity to, to the predicted DRB1s using uh, recombinant HLAs. Now, looking at peptide presentation in the propresent assay, we see that uh, everybody C really presents quite efficiently peptides in helix 2. So that could be a problem. But then, looking at the DCT assay, actually both of them are quite inert. So apparently maybe this peptide is not recognized by T cells. So, this was also very interesting. So it tells you, I guess, that you need all kinds of orthogonal assays to, to draw a conclusion in the end. So, my conclusions would be that in silico prediction tools can be applied early in the lead candidate selection process, but they have to be followed by other assays like ProPresent or DCT or PBMC immunogenicity analysis uh, when you're down to a few final candidates. But I think my view is that when combining cellular assays such as DCT with ProPresent, you have a very powerful tool for predicting immunogenicity of uh, biopharmaceutical leads before going into the patients. So with that, I thank you. Uh,